Welcome to everyone who's joined us. Uh, I'm Kristen Cannon, I'm the Northeast Deputy Regional Manager and we've got the agenda up for tonight. So you can take a look at that uh, in just a second. I'll have Mark Leslie give a welcome and an introduction and kind of talk about some things that are going on in the state and in the region. Um, and then we will do the election of the representative to um, the Northeast Caucus representative to the statewide sportspersons roundtable. And our current representative, Sol, will talk a little bit before we do that. Um, and then Jeff Spohn is going to give us an update on the aquatics happenings in the region. We've got Mark Lamb's going to talk about the, an update for the state wildlife area pass, which we've discussed at the last few meetings. Uh, Lance Carpenter is going to talk about uh, our, our big game herds here in the Northeast. Um, then we'll kick it up to Scott Rausch and he'll talk about the Keep Colorado Wild um, Pass and legislation. And, uh, and Jody will finish us off and talk about a uh, public process that we've got going on for big game license allocation. And we should have plenty of time for questions after that or throughout. Um, if you have a question, and you can put it in the, the Q&A section. Um, we will get to it if it pertains to what we're discussing. We'll try to ask it at the time. Um, otherwise, we'll save them until the end. And if you submitted a question already, we will answer those first at the, when we get to the question portion if we haven't answered them already throughout the evening. So, um, so with that, I will turn it over to Mark and uh, stop sharing my screen so you can see us better. And we'll get going. Thanks, Kristen. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight, February 9th, 2022. I'm Mark Leslie, the Northeast Region Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy evenings and busy schedules to join us tonight and give us some feedback. We'd like to give you some updates on some things that are going on with the agency and in the Northeast Region. We've got a lot of great staff from the Northeast Region and our policy and planning um, here on the call, and I'm going to just go around really quickly and try to introduce them and not uh, not miss anybody. But I'll I'll go from where I am on my screen, and, and we'll start with Jason Clay's, our public information officer for the Northeast Region. Jeff Spones, our senior aquatic biologist. Mark Lamb is the Area One Area Wildlife Manager. Lance Carpenter is our senior terrestrial biologist. Jody Kennedy, policy and planning. Matt Martinez is Area 5 Area Wildlife Manager in the Denver Metro area in Jefferson County. Kristen introduced herself, Chris introduced herself, Kristen Cannon, Deputy Regional Manager. Uh, Jason Surface is Area Wildlife Manager up in Area 4 in Fort Collins. Brandon Muller is the Assistant Area Wildlife Manager in Fort Collins, Area 4. Scott Roush, Deputy Regional Manager, Northeast Region. And we have Saul Soliday, he's uh, our representative on the on the Northeast Caucus. So thank you very much for joining us. If I missed anybody, I uh, apologize. And uh, we've got a few people that are not on the call right now that have other things going on that couldn't make it. So if you have questions for any of the folks in that area, we'll try our best to answer them for you. So I wanna first talk a little bit about what's going on uh, legislatively and habitat wise and property wise, those kinds of things. We've had some had some good, uh, I would say, successes recently. Uh, you may have heard that we were able to purchase Colorado Clay's shooting facility out uh, east of Brighton here recently. And that I think that was a real win. We became aware that that facility was for sale about a year and a half ago. And we made the proper steps and pushed them up through the channels to get approval to take those forward for fee title purchase. And those of you on the call probably know that it's pretty difficult for the division to get fee title purchase uh, of properties. And that's not generally the, the route we take to get access to recreational properties, those kinds of things. But in this case, that was really the only option if we were gonna pursue that facility and we were able to do that. So we used Pittman Robertson money, which funded about 90% of the purchase of that that facility, and then we used uh, Colorado Lottery money, some of our, our quadrant of GOCO and lottery funds to, to purchase the rest of it. And so right now we have that facility being operated by uh, one of the former owners of the facility as a concessionaire for a year. 
So we started that January one. And uh, so we're, we're in business. We wanted to make sure that there was a seamless transition between the private ownership and CPW owning that. And uh, I think we accomplished that. So we still got some, some work to do moving that one forward, but I think that's an exciting, uh, exciting thing. We all know how important it is to have places to shoot. And we have the Cameo facility on the, on the West Slope over at Grand Junction, Palisade. And this does not compete with Cameo by any means for what it offers, but it is a very important and very world class sporting class facility over here on the Eastern Slope and gets a lot of use. We also purchased some uh, uh, addition to our state wildlife area, uh, Douglas Mountain up by Georgetown on our Georgetown state wildlife area. And so with, with these fee title uh, purchases, this is uh, our RFP process, which is our habitat stamp funding that helps us purchase those kinds of properties uh, for habitat. We generally try to get access. We do conservation easements, we can do fee title, we can do conservation easements with access easements. And so we were able to purchase this property, which is a very important piece of ground up there off of Highway 40 for the bighorn sheep herd that lives in that area, elk and deer, and there's uh, aquatic fishing access to it as well. And it's, and it's a huge uh, important property for migration for future uh, crossings, for my, my, you know, migration corridor crossing there on Highway 40. So that's a good one. We also purchased an in-holding uh, out in area three on uh, our Elliott State Wildlife Area, the, the depreced property. And so that one's coming on online as well. So we got, we got that one through. And then it, one that's not in our region, but it's uh, the Twin Spruce Ponds and it's in the Southwest region. So we had to take these, the last step in the, in the process basically was, a, uh, we'll go through a little bit of leadership team Habitat Stamp Committee had to approve these and, and move them forward. Then we took them to the commission, our Parks and Wildlife Commission, they approved them to move them forward. And then we take them to the legislature through the Capital Development Committee and they moved them forward and approved them. And so uh, I, I consider those to be huge, huge wins for the agency and the sportsmen and women of the state of Colorado. So those are, those are important. We're working on, you probably are aware of the uh, Sweetwater Lake State Park over on the White River National Forest. That's kind of our newest state park where our governor is really pushing for state park access to deal with uh, the, the public's thirst for outdoor recreation. And nowhere do we see that uh, in effect anywhere more than in the Northeast region here on the Front Range. We have uh, a lot of outdoor recreation opportunities and the public just, you know, like I said, has a thirst for it and really want to get out there. So it's incumbent upon our agency to try to work with local partners, our federal partners, and to try to get access and uh, and protect habitat at the same time. But but that state park is uh, is our newest one. And we also brought online Fisher's Peak State Park down by Trinidad. So that's a good that's a good one. We're working on some other options as well. So I, and I, I forgot to mention that Colorado Clays is actually going to be uh, designated a state recreation area, as is Cameo. I'll talk a little bit. Of, any questions about that? Does anybody? Maybe I'll wait till the end to take enter, entertain any questions. But one of the I want to talk. We're in the middle of the legislative session or the early part of the legislative session, and so there's a lot of activity around bills. You can imagine that. Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is at the center of a lot of the, the different bills that are going on. I can't talk about all of them, but I can give an update on, on one or two of them. One that specifically I think is, is really interesting is the, uh, the bill that was introduced to ban mountain lion, bobcat, and lynx hunting. Of course, we don't have any lynx hunting in the state of Colorado anyway as, a, as an endangered species, but that generally generated a lot of controversy and discussion, as you can imagine. And that was heard at the uh, Senate Ag Committee um, last in the, uh, last week, late last week. And so that bill was uh, PI'd, which is postponed indefinitely after about three and a half hours of testimony on both sides of the issue, uh, animal rights proponents and sports men and women that wanted to continue to allow Colorado Parks and Wildlife to be the agency that manages the hunting 
and take and recreation of those species. So ultimately the bill, like I said, was, was uh, postponed indefinitely. And uh, I think the bill sponsor can bring it back late, bring back a different version, uh, late bill status, if she so chooses, if she can get that support. And we hear rumblings that it might just be related to Bobcat. She could, she could bring back the bill, I, I guess, uh, with some changes and see what that, see what that does. As you know, we have uh, the ballot initiative process in Colorado, and so that might be what ends up happening with this particular issue. So it's not done yet, but I just want to say that I think one of the huge reasons why this bill ended up being PI'd. Uh, at, at the committee level was because of the outpouring of sportsmen and women that let their voices be known to the legislature. And so I wanna thank everybody that's listening on this call and those that aren't uh, for, the, for the support. And, and I, think, uh, I think your voices were heard and I think the decision was made um, by the legislature. And uh, I think you can all be, be happy that, that you have a, a strong voice in the state of Colorado. So thank you. I wanna talk a little bit about wolves. Of course, that's uh, kind of front and center on a lot of people's radar right now. And so, as you know, uh, Amendment 114 demanded that the, directed I should say, that the Division of Parks and Wildlife will develop a plan to reintroduce gray wolves into the state by December 31st of 2023. And to that end, we are developing the plan with the guidance and uh, counsel of a sports person's ad advisory group and a technical working group made up of scientists from around the country that have experience with wolf management. And so we're being very thoughtful and careful about how we may move forward through that process. We've had several meetings statewide of the, we call it the SAG and the TWIG. And so we're trying to get the word out and let people have an opportunity to voice their opinions when we can. We've also had discussions at the commission level. So the SAG and the TWIG will be advising the Parks and Wildlife Commission on the final plan. And so what our plan right now is, is that I, Jody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the timetable is that we will have a draft plan in front of the commission by next May, uh, a year from May is my understanding. Is that correct, Jody? I, that sounds right to me, Mark. I'd have to double check to make sure. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure I wasn't too far off, but I think that's the plan. It changed a little bit, but we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in that process, as you can imagine. And so we have a lot of staff members in uh, Assistant Director Reed DeWalt's branch that are working on this as well as in the regions. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very important process. And as you may know, we have wolves in the state right now. We had uh, the first pack of wolves that uh, had reproduced from a, a male and a female up in North Park last year. And so we have eight wolves on the ground from that pack that uh, we haven't named the pack or anything like that, but they're still up in that North Park area. And then we get reports of other wolves in um, you know, singles here and there uh, that haven't necessarily been verified. So we, we feel like they're on their way here, they're coming, they're already here. And so we're gonna end up dealing with them as, as is everybody else. We wanna be thoughtful about it. And we want that we wanna have the ability to manage them properly when they're, when they're on the ground. So. We haven't set, and the SAG and the TWIG haven't set any numbers as far as how many animals will be released yet. That's all still being discussed. We haven't set any numbers as per target population levels. We haven't, you know, they're still discussing a lot of issues related to animal damage and livestock damage and predation. As you might uh, be aware, we've had some uh, predation up in the North Park area, <clears throat> a couple of cattle, excuse me, and a couple of dogs, uh, working guard dogs. So the division is responsible for game damage is resulting from wolves as per the uh, amendment 114 and, the, and the, the statute. So we're working with those landowners to provide compensation to them for the livestock that, that uh, can be proven that were taken by wolves. And the dog, the guard dogs 
uh, because they are private property used in the production of agricultural materials. And then I'll move on to the last little thing before I kick it back over to Kristen and take any questions that you might have. Uh, this year marks the 125th anniversary of the Colorado, what was the Colorado Division of Wildlife, and now we're Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And so to that end, we're having a few regional receptions. The first one will be in the Northeast region on April 7th. So we're inviting the public to come out and celebrate with us the, the fact that we have been successfully managing wildlife in the state and managing parks in the state for 125 years. And I think we've done a pretty darn good job of it. And I think uh, we've got a lot of staff members that are on board with this, this celebration and putting this group together and doing, doing a lot of the work. But I, I wanna thank uh, Bar Lake Park Manager, Ms. Michelle Subert, who volunteered for special assignment to kind of lead this 125th celebration and the planning of it, which you can imagine is huge. And she's done a great job and she's, she continues to do a great job. So as I said, our Northeast celebration is April 7th uh, and it will be, uh, I can't remember the name of the distillery, but it'll be at a distillery down in Denver. We can get the word out to everybody. We'll have press releases uh, out on that. And so I think, uh, I think that's exciting. So each region will have a, a, a reception and then we're also going to probably do something out of Colorado Clays uh, sometime in June. So last little thing I'd like to mention is that with this virtual format, I'm, I'm hopeful that the next one of these things, we can sit down and see each other face to face. We just decided we weren't sure what the landscape was gonna look like at this time. So we decided to have it virtual. It's not as effective, I realize. It's kind of, you know, it's convenient in some ways, but it, it just, you know, if you're old school like me, you like to meet people face to face, shake hands or bump elbows or whatever you want to do, and uh, maybe even drink a libation. So that's kind of what we're, we're thinking we'll do at the next one and looking forward to that. The commission meeting will be, um, the commission meeting is going to be in, uh, March and found out today from the director that uh, we're, we're likely going to be in person and at the Hunter Ed building in March. And so be looking for the, the announcement on that. So I think with that, I'm not running, running out of air. I'm going to turn it back over to Kristen and uh, she can fill you in. But if you have any questions, uh, send them out in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Thank yeah, you. Mark, we do have a few questions and I would like to encourage everyone if you've got a question to actually put it in the Q&A because that just helps us kind of check them off as we answer them. Otherwise, they might get lost in the chat. Um, you can use the chat function if you want and we'll try to keep up on it. Um, but, uh, but that Q&A just helps actually keep us organized and make sure even if we don't get your questions answered during the meeting tonight, um, we can circle back with you and answer it later. Um, so we did have a question, um, has CPW done bobcat studies as of late that provides approximate numbers and when was the last study done? Um, Lance, I don't know if you want to answer that or Mark, if you want to, you want to try that, I, I can answer it, but, um, you might have more information and history and background on it. Let's throw that one to Lance and see how he does with it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I don't. And something here, Mark and, and uh, Kristen, I don't know if we actually have done a Bobcat study. I think we're in the process, but I don't think we've done one. So, I mean, if we have, I'm new at this position. I just got into the senior position in August. So, um, if you guys know, that'd be awesome because I don't know off the top of my head. You know, I th I'd say we have robust Bobcat populations, but we don't have population numbers. And so, I think from anecdotal information and from what we see out on the ground and, and the public sees out on the ground reports of them uh, you know everywhere really in the state they're ubiquitous throughout the state i think we've got good good bobcat populations however i think we are having discussions about getting better statistical information on bobcat populations. so i think that'll be important i think you'll see something coming down the pike in the future Great, and so we have another question for wolf reintroduction. What role does the federal government play? Well, that's a that's a bag of worms, and so 
right now they're under state um, they're state threatened spe state endangered species and so under chapter 10 with the Parks and Wildlife Commission uh, and CPW is the management agency that are in charge of managing wolves in the state right now. So the federal government doesn't have a role per se in the management of wolves at this time. However, if they become listed again as a federal endangered or threatened species, then the fed, federal government, the US Fish and Wildlife Service would take over management at that time. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, that's, uh, that's where we're at right now. They were delisted federally. There was, an, an, uh, I think, uh, a request by a group to the feds, federal, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service to relist them. So they're, they're looking at that relisting request right now. But in the meantime, they're still under state management. Thanks, Mark. And I think the last one, and then we'll move on from this, but we'll save these questions. If there's other questions, we'll save them uh, for the end. Um, I thought I heard there were wolves on the Cold Springs Mountain area. Is this true? Well, of course, that's up in the extreme northwest corner of the state, up by Irish Canyon and Vermilion Creek. And uh, there had been wolves up there, and th there were, I think, six a uh, couple years ago, and we hadn't seen, we haven't seen that pack, um, in you know, in that in that uh, vicinity recently, and so we'd gotten reports of a single wolf up there in that area, but that's that's about all we know right now. So we haven't we haven't documented that that pack at this. Point. Good, thanks for the questions and thanks Mark for taking those on. Um, we'll just move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the election of the Northeast Caucus representative to the Sportspersons Roundtable. Um, I'm gonna put in the chat a link to um, our webpage that talks about the roundtable and just talk about it briefly. And Jody knows quite a bit about it too. She runs the statewide roundtable. Uh, this, this is an opportunity for sportspersons to get together and talk directly to the director and other staff. It, it's similar to this only on a statewide level. We have representatives on the round table that were appointed. So they applied and were appointed to a position on the round table. And then each region has two representatives who are elected. And so Saul is one of our elected representatives. Our other elected representative actually moved to a different region in the state. And so we are, um, holding our election tonight to um, fill her seat that is, is now vacant. And so what we'll do is I'll let um, Saul talk for a little bit about anything he wants, but you know, what it's like to be a, a representative. And then uh, we have four people who are running tonight for that seat and we'll let them each, I'll bring you all up as a panelist and um, we'll call on you one by one and give you a few minutes to talk about yourself and why you are running. Um, and then I will describe how we will vote. So um, I'm going to throw it over to Saul and uh, and let him him have the mic. Cool. Thanks, Kristen, appreciate it. So good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Soliday and I go by Saul. Um, and I'm one of the two Northeast region representatives in the round table. And I'm serving my second year of, of the, uh, the two year term. I live in Frederick, Colorado. Uh, many people call it Fred Neck, um, but we, we think differently. Um, I, you know, uh, I'll give you a little bit about my background and stuff, but I, you know, I've been trying to communicate the meetings and, and other activities of uh, CPW and the Roundtable via some social posts and trying to inform people of uh, other CPW successes and stuff. Um, so I try to uh, try to, uh, identify areas that we can communicate with uh, with constituents, the the, uh, the hunter fisherman community out there, and try to do that. Um, just to give a background on myself, I thought it'd be helpful uh, for those other candidates as well. Is that um, professionally, I've I've been involved in the uh, geographic information system and remote sensing or digital mapping profession for about six uh, 36 years. So um, I wanted to be a map maker when I was in fourth grade. So my whole uh, my whole career has really been focused on 
on uh, generating maps. I currently serve as the chief revenue officer for a global company called Voxel Maps, and we're headquartered in San Francisco, but looking at moving our HQ to the Denver area. So that'll be good. And my, I, my boss will like keep hands on me as well, right? Um, in my free time, uh, I've been an active volunteer in the hunter conservation community for over 20 years, and primarily with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Uh, with the RMEF, I'm a life member, habitat partner, business partner in conservation, and, and I actually served seven years as the Colorado State Volunteer Chair from 2004 to 2010. Um, and I continue to uh, volunteer at a number of banquets. So if you happen to come to the Denver RMEF banquet coming up on March 12th, you know, please say hello because I'll be working the life sponsor table and I'll be one of the loud mouse on the live auction ring crew as well. So um, please say hello. Uh, I also enjoy calling elk, and I've been a judge for a number of competitions, including uh, the World Championships of Elk Calling, and uh, most recently I did that last summer in Park City at the Mountain Festival. That was a, that was a great time. Uh, you know, in my, in my free time, I do some other things. This past summer, I, uh, I founded a, a 5013C called the Rocky Mountain Heroes Foundation. rmheroes.org is the website, and it's a nonprofit focused on getting uh, disabled US vets and their kids out on hunting adventures. So uh, working with CPW outreach coordinators in the Northeast, Southeast and the Northwest regions, this year we put together uh, hunts and I personally took 15 first time youth hunters out with their veteran parents on uh, pronghorn and elk hunts. Uh, so we had, a we had a great year there. Uh, I also had the pleasure to take five Purple Heart recipients up to Wyoming for some uh, some pronghorn hunts as well. So it was quite the hunting season for everybody, right? Including myself. Um, I guess in, in closing, what, one thing I'd like to say is uh, that's kind of contrary to a recent post I saw on I Hunt Colorado Facebook page, uh, and it was regarding the Northeast region uh, archery community not being represented by the ar an archer on the round table. And I'll just say, you know, I'm a rifle muzzle loader and archery hunter. And uh, it actually, you know, had several articles published in uh, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal. You know, one for my Uncle Padre Bull, and one for my record book Saint Vrain uh, Bighorn Sheep. So uh, I would just suggest that uh, if you hear something about the the roundtable delegates, don't believe everything you read online. So it's uh, it's been fun. It's been fun. It's been great to interact with the uh, the CPW staff, and uh, I look forward to continue to serve in, in various capacities. Awesome, thank you for that, Saul. Appreciate it. Um, are there any quick questions for Saul before we move on? I don't think I see any. Okay. Um, so Jonathan Norris, you, I have tried to promote you to panelist. I think you have to accept on your end um, to be promoted. I can try one more time, make sure I'm doing it right. And I think that might've worked. There we go. All right. Well, we'll give, we'll give Jonathan a chance to, uh, to get all set up. And in the meantime, um, Paul, do you, would you like to go first? Oh, or Jonathan's ready to go. So Jonathan, Hi. why don't you, why don't you start us off? Can you hear me okay? Yep, sure can. Okay, just doing a check. Um, normally use Teams. Uh, my name is Jonathan Norris. Um, I do a, a, quite a bit of archery. Um, well, let's back up a little bit. I do quite a bit of hunting um, and fishing. I have done it since I was uh, pretty small. Um, I just wanted to basically support uh, CPW. Um, also, uh, I think public education is, is pretty important. So that's something I wanted to focus on if I were elected. Um, I'm going to keep it pretty short. Um, I do uh, support all methods of take uh, uh, as far as hunting goes. Um, and I do think uh, public education is pretty important at this time, uh, just with all the ballot measures uh, going, going into effect, um, uh, or at least the, the ones that have passed already. Um, but that's about all I have. Um, if you could uh, vote for me, I think I would uh, serve CPW well, as well as hunters and anglers. All right, thank you, Jonathan. 
Um, okay, Paul, now would you like to go? You've got to unmute yourself and put your camera on if you so desire. So can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Thank you very much. Let me find a camera here. My wife is helping me. And she doesn't know what she's doing either. That's quite all right. We don't know what we're doing either. And we've been doing this for two years now. Paul, you may see a toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom link that should allow you to enable a camera. Share screen? No, not nope, that It's one. to the it left of that. It should start say start video. video. Start video. Okay, there we go. There, there, you, are. Are. there you are. <laughs> what a pleasure. Kristen, thanks for the note recently. And Mark Leslie, I've seen you around more than uh, a lot recently. And Jason Sarvis, welcome to the uh, Fort Collins area. So Paul Navarro is uh, going to show you a little bit or read you a little bit about his background and what I have to offer. So I've been a resident in Colorado since 92 to present. Uh, retired in 2002 from owning and operating a tourist lodge, bed and breakfast restaurant tavern business on Lake Granby, which Trisha and I owned for 10 years. Prior to moving to Colorado, I was a sales rep for 20 years in Northern Ohio for the Lazy Boy Chair Company, but I was never a lazy boy. Uh, still, at an average, avid and active big game hunter, fisherman and waterfowl hunter. Actually, Trisha and I were up at Lake John for the last two days and we brought back two limits of uh, cutthroats for dinner. So very nice. Past member of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, National Wild Turkey Foundation. Current member of the Colorado Traditional Archery Society and I'll be going to their banquet on Friday and Saturday over near Grand Junction. Life member of the Colorado Bowhunters Association. I was fortunate enough to be voted at Bow Hunter of the Year 10 years ago. I have a service award and also I'm a member of their Hall of Fame with all the activities I was involved in. CBA Board of Directors for seven years from 2003 to 10, currently an active CBA area rep and still attend many of the CBA Board of Directors meetings. I was also a becoming a Bow Hunter Program Coordinator in the Northeast CBA region which the uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife region overlays mostly for five years where I taught two sections of the course and then mentored new bow hunters in the field on live hunt for deer or turkeys on private properties in Eastern Colorado where I obtained permission. During my CBA board service, I was the DOW, now Parks and Wildlife CBA liaison for six years, 2004 to 10 where I interacted with Colorado Parks and Wildlife staff and commission members and attended most, if not all, Division of Wildlife Commission meetings and workshops across the states for those six years. Recently, I've watched many of the Zoom commission meetings this past two years to keep up to date on current actions and issues. I also have attended many of the local Colorado Parks and Wildlife Northeast Regional meetings. Recently attended or watched many of the wolf reintroduction meetings to date, attended in person the two day roundtable wolf management meeting in Denver this last December, as well as watching the recent two day SAGS stakeholder advisory group Zoom meetings. Actually, I was the lead person for Stop the Wolf organization in Northeast Colorado, which opposed the forced reintroduction of the gray wolf, but supported the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission's memo that supported the wolf's natural migration, but not the forced introduction. Prior to the pandemic, I was invited by two local business groups to conduct a wolf reintroduction information meeting. And I also addressed the Larimer County commissioners on that same issue. I spent four years in the Air Force from 1959 to 63, and then college, Northern Michigan University in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I have a small, a large, strong, background in college degrees in natural science and a master's degree in regional planning. And I was hired by the state of South Dakota in 1971 to join a 10 county planning team to work with local grassroots county committees to develop programs to make the area a better place to live, to recreate and to make a living in rural areas of Eastern South Dakota. 
I understand Colorado's population growth issues. When Trisha and I moved to Colorado in 91, there was 3.2 million. And we all know that it's 5.7, heading for 6 million in the near future. Um, so I understand the population growth and how it affects our natural resources, wildlife populations, and habitat. Uh, I would be a strong voice for sport for sports persons in the northeast region of Colorado. In closing, I want to be part of the solution to the ever-growing challenges that face Colorado citizens and the natural resources of Colorado and work with sports persons in Northeast Colorado and the parks and wildlife staff to identify and solve many of those challenges and issues. And just a few of those issues that I see that may affect sportsmen in Colorado. And I was very happy to hear Mark's report on public access especially with the state trust lands and some of the new Sweetwater State Park and the migration corridors and the Georgetown State Wildlife Area and the Colorado Clays Purchase. That's wonderful stuff. And I know it's a top priority for uh, parks and wildlife. And I'm willing to uh, offer my assistance and advice and, uh, and recommendations along the way. Uh, it, and it seems that the waterfall duck migration has altered its timing and course during the past few years in Northeastern Colorado. Adjusting the Colorado duck split in the Northeast region could be helpful for better hunter success in the late November, December timeframe, especially for duck hunters. And there is no doubt pheasant populations are surely cyclic here in Northeast Colorado. A lot depends on weather, moisture, and crop production and available land to hunt. I heard recently that while walk in areas have increased in number, but the size and quality of the areas have diminished some. Surely a very growing challenge for farmers. The Colorado Parks and Wildlife and for hunters. And lastly, Mark talked about the bell initiatives and legislative bills. Uh, I personally uh, emailed the uh, House and the Senate Ag Committee members opposing the Bobcat and Lion issue, as did the CBA, and many, many, over 10,000 emails were sent to those people. Uh, and that's a big reason why that is gone off record. But as you know, you know in the recent news, and I'm going to take 30 seconds, there's big, a huge billboard on the interstate in Denver showing a great big mountain lion and addressing the issue that they, they, the Humane Society needs support to get this bill or this, the citizen petition back in line. So ballot initiatives to undermine the Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, commission's ability to scientific manage Colorado's wildlife, I see as a big issue for all Coloradoans and particularly here in the Northeast. So thank you very much for me to provide you with that information. Thank you, Paul. Um, I see I see the question we have for Jonathan. If there's any other questions as our, um, our um, candidates speak, just type them in the questions and we'll, we'll ask them right at the end after we give Matthew now a chance to speak. Um, so with that, um, Matthew, if you are ready to go, you can start when, when you're ready. All right, thank you very much, Kristen. I love Colorado. Uh, when I was one years old in 1977, my parents moved to Colorado and I grew up in Rangeley, Colorado in the Northwest corner of the state. And I graduated high school there and I enjoy spending time outdoors. After high school, I went to college, joined the Air Force ROTC program and was in the Air Force uh, five years of active duty. I entered active duty in August of 2001, just a month before September 11th. And so that was some interesting time in the Air Force, but perhaps another time. Uh, when I got out of the Air Force, I went to law school on the GI Bill. And now I'm a patent attorney and I, help, I work at a law firm that has over 500 attorneys. And I represent uh, Fortune 100 companies and individual inventors protect their inventions. Uh, my wife and I, we are really glad to be able to get back to Colorado after law school. We have six children and their ages are five to 18. And I love spending time outdoors with them. With our oldest, uh, our son, I've been belly crawling uh, at Pawnee National Grasslands trying to get close enough to antelope to uh, 
to harvest one. And uh, with my second oldest, with our second oldest uh, daughter, she's 16 years old. I took her on her first deer hunt this last year. Uh, we have a couple of boys that are younger, ages five and 11, and they love fishing. And if they could have a wish, I think it would be for me to be their full-time fishing guide on the weekends. Uh, if they could do that. And so we enjoy uh, spending time outdoors. I also do volunteer work. Uh, I've mentored some new hunters. As far as volunteer work, I work with some youth programs. Uh, there's one youth program that needed some help with a uh, shooting range. And so I became a certified range safety officer through the NRA. And I helped with a uh, a youth encampment with several, with a couple hundred uh, young boys that were uh, being introduced to shooting for the first time. I was on, uh, so I was able to help with that. Uh, last year, I was on a backpacking trip with another youth group uh, up in the Buffalo Peaks Wilderness. And later on this month, I'm going to be going up snowshoeing with some youth and exploring some uh, places up near Brainerd Lake. So I, spent, I, I enjoy spending time outdoors. And uh, one of the most frustrating things that I get though, uh, one of the most frustrating, uh, one of my biggest frustrations is when I go outdoors and go to enjoy the public land and I find out that there is a no trespassing or a private sign posted on public land. And one of the reasons why I'd like to be a, a Northeast delegate is to look at ways or explore ways that we can limit people putting up no trespassing signs on public land. I mean, we've heard about uh, what Mark was saying about what we're doing to get access to public lands, but yet there's a number of places in the Northeast region that are being uh, eaten up and privatized uh, illegally. And one of the ways that I see that, one of the ways I think we can go after some of these people who are illegally putting up no trespassing signs is to first identify them and investigate it. And then I don't know if many people are aware, but there's a number of law firms, including my own, that give pro bono time for attorneys to work on projects free of charge. And so I could get in and work on some of these projects and, and write letters, engage with uh, people who are doing this illegal behavior as a way to get them to stop it. And so I, I could send a letter. The advantage of that would be that the state's not having to send out bad letters, but it'd be coming from a law firm. And then we could look at options. We, we could say, please remove what it is. Uh, because a lot of times what's happening is that these landowners that are near public property are, are putting no trespassing so people don't come near their house. There is one place uh, just west of Boulder that's at that had a no trespassing sign you know, over 400 yards from their property. And it was a big piece of property that wasn't being, wasn't being accessed by sportsmen. I was camping with my three boys uh, last year and I had a, uh, a, land, a nearby landowner come up and try to kick us off the property. And I ended, he said he was gonna call the cops. We ended up calling the sheriff and got deputies out there and said, and they were able to verify that I was on public land. It was properly dispersed camping, uh, but this landowner had put no trespassing signs up. And so by working with volunteer attorneys is that that would be a way that, uh, that the state CPW could leverage uh, some of its resources and that we could uh, go after to open up some of these areas that are being closed off by private landowners that are, that are putting up these signs illegally on state land. And so that's what, that's what got me motivated to apply for this Northeast position. So one of the things I bring to the table is one is I'm a father, I have several children who are in the middle of getting involved in hunting and fishing and these outdoor programs. And so I can bring that uh, parental perspective with, uh, with youth right now. And then I also bring a legal side that to see if we can leverage some of the legal community uh, volunteer wise to help with some of these uh, outdoor programs. Great. Thank you, Matthew, really appreciate it. Um, so I do have, there's one more person running and, uh, and they had a, a pretty bona fide family emergency come up. 
Um, and so I told them they could stay on the ballot and I would read um, the little excerpt that they gave about them. They, uh, it, his name is Brent Lambrecht and he submitted a few sentences. And so I will read those for you. Um, Brent says, I live in Mead and I am 47 years old. I have lived here in the area for 46 years. I mainly hunt elk, but occasionally do goose and turkey. I grew up farming, so I have an appreciation for landowners and also hunters. I am interested in this position to be able to give sportsmen a voice and to be a part of the decision-making. I feel like laws and regulations are passed without our input and with no explanation, leaving us upset and feeling insignificant. I have never done anything like this before, but I'm not afraid to ask or voice opinions. As sportsmen, we spend a lot of money and time to do what we love and need to be heard. Thank you. So I can't answer questions on behalf of Brent, but if there are any questions for um, our candidates, Jonathan, do you wanna answer the question that was asked if you are affiliated with any statewide organizations? Sure. Um, so basically I'm a member of, I, I tried sending it for some reason, uh, it wasn't sent. Um, so I am a member of the Colorado Bow Hunters Association, TRCP, uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, and also the Wildlife Society. Um, I, I think I donate to other groups as well, but I'm not really an active member. So it probably wouldn't be fair to mention those. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Any other questions for our candidates? I'll give you a minute to... Oh. Right. Well, feel free to put in a question while I go on to describe how voting is going to work. And so I am going to put a link in the chat. And this link is going to go to a Google form. Um, the Google form is a ballot and will, um, uh, will allow you, it, it's got a little blurb on everybody, including the one I just read from Mr. Lambrecht. And so you can read that over and vote only one vote per person, please. Um, you can vote for who you would like to elect as representative. Um, I'm gonna leave this poll open until nine o'clock tonight. So if you wanna wait till the end of the meeting and spend some time and think about it, that's totally fine. Uh, if you uh, um, wanna vote right now, that's fine too. We just ask that we do one vote per person. So I will go ahead and see if I can, let me make, let's see. Kristen, yep. we did have uh, one question for all the candidates coming. Oh, in. did I miss it? Address it just came oh, in. Oh shoot, I didn't scroll down. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so um, we had a question for all the candidates. What are some ways you think you'll be able to communicate the benefits and importance of hunting and conservation with the public? Um, and let's see, uh, Paul. Do you want to take that first? Sure. There's no doubt education and communication is important to the public. I would expect if I could do an op-ed in some of the newspapers, that would be important. I think social media is important. I'm a uh, current member of the Colorado Bow Hunters, which has developed a fantastic site to communicate with our members of 3000. And so, and then, communicating with the uh, Parks and Wildlife staff. And of course they have their Facebook, they have their website, which is great. Uh, those are the ways that I would communicate. I think it would be more through the Parks and Wildlife staff, but also through organizations that I belong to. For an example, when I go to the SeaTask, uh, Colorado Traditional Archery Society's Banquet on Saturday morning, uh, I will be giving them a report of what the CBA is doing and some of the issues and how we're handling these. And they in turn can pass that to their members through their newsletters. And we have a fantastic new newsletter magazine that we communicate with our members on a variety of issues. And I can certainly write a small column in our magazine to communicate about what's going on in the Northeast region uh, so to answer that question, uh, that's how I would go about doing that. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, Jonathan, do you want to go next? Again, the question is, what are some ways you think you'll be able to communicate the benefits and importance of hunting and conservation with the public? And you're muted, sorry. 
controls don't work so well. Um, so um, I think it, it's important to use the media to the fullest extent, um, just like we, we did with Hug a Hunter campaign. So that, that's more than just regional, obviously. Um, working with outreach groups as well on some of the uh, hunting benefits, as well as conservation uh, benefits from hunting and fishing for that matter. So I, I think I'd be pretty well-rounded in uh, being able to uh, communicate those, those values. Thank you, Jonathan and Matthew. Um, again, the question is, uh, what are some ways you think you'll be able to communicate the benefits of and importance of hunting and conservation with the public? Thank you. I think there's some great publication that's out there. As far as me personally, one of the ways that I could help with the hunting and also conservation is as we get the, uh, these projects going where we work together with pro bono attorneys is when I reach out to people in the firm and, and, it, and I'm able to explain the value of having access to public lands and getting other attorneys on board with help fighting for those causes, that, that, that there will be more people willing to fight for access to public lands, whether it be for hunting or just even enjoying wildlife. I think that there's some great overlap there where people who may not want to hunt still like to enjoy wildlife. And I think reaching out to those types of people who may enjoy the outdoors but maybe not hunt uh, in ways that help open access to public lands is a great way to uh, make friends and uh, make, Colorado, make Colorado a place for everybody to enjoy. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and then we'll go with this next question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and uh, open the voting. Um, what are your thoughts on trying to limit the over-the-counter elk tags for non-residents? And we'll go backwards this time, Matthew. I'm gonna put you back on the hot seat and let you answer that one first. Thank you. My initial thought is I'm not a fan of living to the out of state. I think that Colorado is a great destination for elk hunting. And I think it's great that we have a state where we can have over-the-counter tags. I've used over-the-counter tags to go hunt elk. And I think it's a great revenue generator for the state. And if there are times when the elk population start decreasing, where we do need to limit how many hunters are out in the field, then I would be in favor of it. But I know that there are certain places like up in the Northwest corner where, where our elk populations are exceeding our targeted thresholds. And so I see no reason to limit uh, out of state hunters right now when it's great for Colorado economy and what it, uh, that those revenues that those tag revenues bring in. And so I, I would be in favor of it if, if our elk population start decreasing in certain areas below the target thresholds. But until then, I think it's great for Colorado. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Jonathan, what do you think? Uh, again, the question is what are your thoughts on trying to limit the over-the-counter elk tags for non-residents? It needs to be evaluated more closely. There is what I would consider, especially during archery season, obviously with over-the-counter, um, there is a perceived crowding issue amongst the hunting community and I, I've seen it firsthand. So that's something to consider. There's also other considerations, including revenue. Um, obviously, one of the uh, Colorado Pirates and Wildlife's uh, important uh, selling points to the public is the fact that a lot of our licenses go back into conservation. So there, there's, there's some issues there as far as limiting the tags and, and including revenue. So we'd have to look at that as well. Um, there's other ideas we could consider as maybe uh, even rotating units uh, for different uh, numbers uh, possibly uh, considering limiting some of the uh, res uh, non-resident tags specifically in certain areas. But again, you'd probably end up uh, possibly con confusing what is perceived already a confusing situation as far as uh, getting tags in the first place and trying to determine the uh, units, so. Thank you, Jonathan. And Paul, um, limiting over-the-counter book tags for non-residents, what do you think? 
great question, and I know this has been looked at for the last 10 years, over-the-counter licenses for non-residents. Well, anything that would happen would have to be somewhat revenue neutral with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, other states around us uh, limit non-residents to maybe 10 or 15% of, of licenses. Uh, that's a model that Colorado could look at uh, to try to see if uh, that would fit Colorado's uh, budgetary goals as far as the uh, parks and wildlife. Uh, I've hunted a lot of over-the-counter areas and I'm successful, but being retired and can hunt the whole season, that is a benefit for me. Um, there's no doubt about it. There's, uh, when I came to Colorado in 88, there was only maybe 26,000 bow hunters in Colorado. Now there's 54,000. The question might be is, if, and let's talk about maybe just a sidebar limit, all going all limited. Uh, how many of those 54,000 would you have to eliminate to bring the number down in bow season that everybody could live with and that would be acceptable. So that's another question too. And then how about the people that have waited 20 years to draw 3301 or 2201, and then it would also all of a sudden go all limited. So over the counter tags, I think the Colorado bow hunters, for an example, and I support that, uh, would, would still like to see over the counter tags. Uh, and there's going to have to be a lot of more public input and a lot of division staff uh, study on this to make it feasible for everybody to go to. Um, it may be shortly happening in the near future and may, as limited tags might be in the near future. But right now, I, I personally and a lot of my fellow hunters like over-the-counter tags. But then there's other hunters that say we need to go limited and I'd rather hunt every couple of years than but again, how much do we limit the non-residents and uh, how many bow hunters that live in Colorado as residents do we limit? Hard question to answer without a lot of studies and input. So, and I'm sure that's on the agenda in the near, very near future, if not now. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So I'm gonna go ahead and there is the link to the poll to vote. Um, you have, uh, like I say, I'll leave it open until about nine o'clock tonight and close it down. I will also email it out to everyone here who's attending, who's provided an email uh, so that in case you don't get to it in the chat or something's not working, at least you'll have it in email and can vote um, until nine tonight. And then I'll also use that to let you know what the results were. Um, so a big, big thank you to um, these gentlemen who have stepped up and offered to donate their time and energy uh, into representing sports persons and working on this issue. And I think any one of them would be an excellent choice. So um, I will leave it up to you all to make that decision. And uh, fellas, I'm gonna put you uh, back as panelists so that you can relax and not have to worry about being on camera. And uh, we will move on to our next topic um, which is an aquatics update from Jeff Spohn. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Spohn, and I'm the senior aquatic biologist uh, on the Platte River Basin Northeast region for CPW. Uh, prior to this uh, position that I hold today, I spent 15 years managing the South Platte River from Denver upstream to the headwaters, including the North uh, Fork of the Platte and through, um, through South Park. So currently um, I supervise one region-wide native species conservation biologist and six, excuse me, five sport fish biologists throughout the region. Um, and lately staff, um, they've been finishing up last year's data, which includes entering the data from all the, the field work this past summer or spring, summer and fall. and now they're in the office um, interpreting and analyzing that data, um, getting that data up on our website. I hope you guys have had the opportunity to look at some of our fish survey summaries. We've got quite a bit of information on our, our higher profile waters that we try to update every couple of years. So staff are in, in the midst of doing that currently. Um, they're also looking at um, adjusting their stocking schedule for this upcoming field season based on the data they collected last year. 
Um, we're also, um, we're constantly evaluating, you know, our current fishing bags, um, and looking at any potential changes that can come our way, um, currently for this upcoming reg cycle, uh, CPW staff at this point in time are not uh, proposing any changes to, um, any length limit or harvest restrictions in the region, um, at this time. And currently, staff are gearing up for annual walleye spawn at Chatfield, or excuse me, at Cherry Creek Reservoir, and also at Pueblo Reservoir. We typically also include Chatfield um, in the mix on that spawning operation. The population there, over the last couple of years, has been suppressed. Uh, so the Northeast Region staff is really focused on our efforts at Cherry Creek Reservoir, where the population is really robust, and we can just um, get a lot better bang for a buck concentrate on Cherry Creek um, this coming year. Um, other than that, we're constantly engaging staff, um, not only in the region, but in aquatics, in our water section, on all the numerous water projects they have going on through the state. Currently, the few um, in the region that are gaining a lot of momentum right now are Halligan Reservoir, outside of Fort Collins, Chimney Hollow Reservoir, and also the ongoing NIST project that um, we're moving into different phases on all those projects, and you guys should be hearing more about those as more developments come. And as far as updates, that's pretty much what I have for you guys this evening, and I'm going to stay on throughout the duration of this meeting, and we'll be monitoring any questions you guys have and be willing to, to answer any questions so i appreciate everybody's participation this evening and thank you very much thank you jeff um i don't see any questions coming for you if any oh mark leslie you have a question i have a question no i have a comment i thank you jeff and uh i i, I just want to say that we have a lot of water projects and he jeff touched on them but we have, I think, 11 active water projects, and it's unbelievable how much staff time each of these projects takes in, in coordination with our, our uh, public and private partners and, and the water companies. And so a lot of times what happens is if there's a NEPA process, a National Environmental Policy Act process, then we provide a fish and wildlife mitigation plan for those, those projects with the water providers and the Parks and Wildlife Commission approves those plans, and then those plans are implemented on those on those particular projects. And so you can imagine some of these projects take 15, 20 years to put into, into, into place. So these are very complicated, and uh, I appreciate all the regional staff, Jeff's staff, our, our staff. Um, Shannon Schaller is not able to be on the call right now, but uh, she oversees our water program in the Northeast region. And, and so it's uh, just a hugely complicated process dealing with uh, Denver water, Northern water, some of these water, Aurora, some of these water providers. So thank you. Just wanted to interject that little comment. Thanks, Mark. We did have a question of what's the project on Halligan in 10 seconds, Jeff, can you describe the Halligan project? <laughs> uh, sure, Halligan Reservoir is currently on the docket to be expanded by the city of Fort Collins to double the capacity. Um, currently, it's uh, the water that exists in Halligan is owned by the North Pool Irrigation Company. Uh, so the proposed project is to rebuild the dam and then add an additional 8,000 acre feet of water for drought contingencies for the city of Fort Collins. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, well, if you think of any questions, we can always try to save them for the end or answer them even after the meeting through email. Um, all right, what we have up next on the docket is Mr. Mark Lamb, and he's just gonna give us a brief update on the State Wildlife Area Pass and issue. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here and giving us some time for uh, CPW. Uh, my name is Mark Lamb. I'm the area wildlife manager in area one, which is uh, Gilpin, Clear Creek, good part of park, and oh, I'll say about half of Jefferson County. Um, I've been with this outfit a really long time. I'll just leave it that way. I'm one of the dinosaurs that are still around this place. So um, I just wanted to give you a really brief 
update of what's been happening with the state wildlife area access pass and where we're hopefully heading. Um, a couple of years ago, this process started when we started seeing the overuse and um, a lot of different activities that were conflicting with wildlife recreation. Um, a lot of internal discussion, um, a lot of ideas thrown around, um, Reader's Digest version, uh, an external working group was thrown together with uh, different organizations. Um, several of our commissioners were on that, on that working group. And we gained, began the process of trying to figure out how to get the wildlife areas back for wildlife and their intended purposes of wildlife recreation. Um, had, had several meetings um, um, and we're at the point now where uh, a little over a year ago, the commission uh, approved that if you were going to be on a state wildlife area, you either needed a valid fishing license, hunting license, or there was the creation of the state wildlife area access pass. Uh, the cost is similar to a fishing license, trying to get some parity on uh, having people who don't fish or hunt um, help pay for recreation. And uh, anyway, to date, uh, there's about maybe seven, 800 of those passes have been sold. Um, we thought actually there'd be more. So that's a little on the disappointing side. Um, but where we're at now is trying to figure out what to do with the wildlife areas. And uh, internally, the AWMs, the 18 AWMs and, and our staffs came up with a, as suggested by this external working group, came with the uh, four different tiers of where the wildlife areas sit. Um, and kind of that's where we're at right now. Um, we're just about to start um, meeting with the external working group, hopefully in the first part of March and continue our discussions on where do we go from here with trying to provide, uh, making sure the wildlife areas are there for wildlife and then wildlife recreation. Um, so it's not much of a, a difference or an update from our last caucus meeting. Um, there's been a couple of things going on uh, recently and Mark talked about a few of them already. So we kind of had a little hiatus, but we're, we're getting the wheels spinning back on the bus. Um, so that, that's about the best I can tell you right now. Um, if there's any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A. And just like Jeff, I'll be here for the whole night. So if all of a sudden you have that epiphany of, oh, I should have asked this, I'll, I'll be here and try to answer whatever I can for you. I want to thank Mark for being on that state wildlife area access group uh, as the area wildlife manager for the state. Uh, appreciate appreciate his uh, expertise and expertise and his influence. And he and I got hired the same day. Uh, he was 17 and I was 35. <laughs> I guess we can see who's aged the best. But I want to thank you for that, Mark. You've done a good job. All right. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, we will roll right along then to Lance and he will give us an update of um, some of our big game herds. I'm gonna share my screen just because I'll share some maps so you know what DAUs he's talking about, the data analysis units and the different herds. Um, and Lance, you can take it away. Sorry about that. I had my screen on mute. Uh, so good evening. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, my name is Lance Carpenter. I'm the Northeast Senior Wildlife Biologist. I'm relatively new to this position um, since uh, mid-August. Before that, I was a wildlife biologist for Area 1 and 5 for 15 years, and I worked with both game and non-game species. Um, so, <clears throat> so I'm just going to give you like a that 30,000 foot view of uh, Big game uh, in northeast in the northeast region. Um, we just finished up our classification flights. Usually in March is when we do our population models and look at you know whether our populations are increasing, and decreasing, set our, set our license numbers and things like that. So we haven't done that yet, but um, this is kind of what we this is based on last year and kind of what we think is going on right now at this point in time. So we start with pronghorn and you know. Really quickly, overall in the Northeast region, we're doing really well for big game in general. The pronghorn, um, you know, the population most DIUs are increasing, uh, like in pH 30 and pH 1, we're slightly above the population objectives. 
um, pronghorn in area three in A1. And you can thank you, Kristen, for sharing these maps. This is great. Um, it's stable to decreasing slightly. And we think one of the reasons why it may be decreasing is because of the continued drought conditions out there. And as I'm talking about these, you know, um, Mark and Jason, Jason and Matt, Todd, if you guys want to jump in, feel free to jump in as well as I'm talking about these. Um, so overall, pronghorn are doing really well. So um, we'll go to elk. Elk, for the most part, in the Northeast region are doing really well. Uh, most DAUs are stable, like in E18 and E9, to increase thing, which uh, we see that in E38 and E39 and E4. So most DAUs are within their population objective range. Uh, so elk are doing really well in the Northeast region for the most part. And we have quite a few coloring studies going on right now that are going to help us uh, out looking at movements um, and get a better idea of habitat use and license setting as well, population numbers as well in some of these elk DAUs. Um, our next one is deer. So overall, deer in the Northeast region, again, are doing well. Most of the DUUs are stable, such as like D17, D4, D27. Um, increasing DAUs are D49, D10. One DAU has decreased slightly, we think, and that's D38. Most of the DAUs are within our population objective ranges. Um, and D17, D49, D27 are actually above their perspective uh, population ranges at this point in time. CWD is continued concern. Uh, so CWD is 5% in many of our DAUs. Uh, D17, D49, D10 are all uh, above 5%. D10 is about 10%. Our highest uh, COVID, <laughs> COVID, sorry, I've been just talking about COVID with some friends of mine tonight, so I apologize, <laughs> CWD, um, are kind of in plain. So like D5, is 30%, D44 is 26%. So these are really high. Again, the, the CWD is based on sampling from last year. We did more sampling this year and we haven't got the data back for those yet. Um, next up is uh, moose. So in the Northeast region, our moose are going well. Most of the DAUs um, are increasing populations or stable. Um, bull harvest remains high. Uh, it's averaging between 98 and 100%. So overall, moose is doing really well in the Northeast region. And I think, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes in some of the, some of our moose units, they're actually becoming a, a problem that we need to uh, address. Um, so for bighorn sheep is next. So bighorn sheep, for the most part, in the Northeast region are doing really well. Um, GMUs, most of the GMUs are within our population objectives and many are increasing like S32, S3, S4, S41, and S42, they're all increasing, which is good. Uh, one, one GMU, uh, S39, which is Silver Heels has decreased. Um, and that's kind of a concern. We're trying to figure out what's going on with that particular herd. Um, then we have go up north to S1, S18, S40, and S50. That's the Pruder, Rewa, and Lone Pine herds. Um, they're actually, they've decreased um, slightly. We have the Kenosha, which is the Kenosha and Terry Mountains, 27 and 23. From historical standards for the Terry and Kenosha, they're low, but in actuality, we're seeing those. Um, two GMUs actually increased slightly, which is really good to see. Those, those two herds have been struggling for years and years and years. Um, same thing with Waterton Canyon. Waterton Canyon is doing really well also. So um, it's great to see that our big heart sheep are doing well. Like I said before, that S39 is a concern and we're trying to figure out uh, what's going on there and Mark, do you want to add anything in there, Mark Lamb? No, Lance, just that we uh, continue to try to figure out what's going on and talking to hikers, talking to just about everybody we can to 
see if we can glean some information of what's what's going on with with those sheep. Um, just kind of a a mystery at this point. Um, yeah. Sorry. Oh yeah. Go ahead, Mark. No, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So we've actually done some uh, flights in there uh, in December and and uh, January to try to find out if we can see where these sheep are hanging out and we haven't been able to, we've done some ground surveys and still we just haven't seen many sheep there. So that is a big concern for us is to try to figure out what's going on with those, with that particular GMU. Um, next is mountain goats. So mountain goats in the Northeast region were down compared to uh, previous years and were below the population objectives. So Bray's Peak, which is like G7, 16, and 15, um, those, the population there is down. We have about 260. Our population objective is about 300. Now that could be due to our survey efforts. Usually with those GMUs, we usually fly those in the summertime. We weren't able to fly this year or last summer because of helicopter mechanical issues. So we did some ground surveys in those areas and ground surveys didn't was the ground surveys we, we saw fewer goats than we have in the past so that can be a contributing factor why those numbers are low just because we weren't able to fly we may be trying to fly these uh, uh goat units this winter probably in march which would be uh different than we've done in the past because we usually do in the summer but in the winter we may yield some really inf really good information on where those goats are so the other one is G4, uh, it's kind of the Mount Evans area. That particular one is below the population objective as well. We managed that herd at 100 to 125, and we have that 98. Um, one of the reasons that particular herd's doing, or goat herd is doing poorly, we think is we have this disease outbreak. It's unknown, it's bacterial enteritis. We haven't been able to isolate the bacteria that's causing it, but it caused severe diarrhea and the kids and yearlings, and it happens in the fall to late fall. And when that happens, we usually lose an entire age class of goats. Um, last couple of years, we've been actually out collecting samples to try to figure out and isolate whether it's bacteria, a virus, um, or what's going on up there. And uh, we have not got the data back on that from the summer, but hopefully we'll, we'll get some information soon on that particular uh, group of goats. So with that, if anybody has any questions, I can take questions as well. At the end, I'll be on until the end as well. We did have a few questions, Lance. Um, so I know, hang on, sorry. Oops. Uh, we had one come in ahead of time about CWD. This might be a good time to answer that. Um, and that one was efforts to contain or reduce CWD, especially in the Eastern Plains units where it is really high. Oh, I think they want to know about efforts to contain, reduce CWD, um, especially in the Eastern Plains units where it is really high. And anecdotally, this questioner has heard many people say there are a lot fewer mature bucks now, especially whitetail. And Todd, I'm not sure if Todd Smith is on. And he can help me with this. I think Todd's on. My apologies, Kristen. Can you rephrase that last part? I, I missed it. Well, so um, what are our efforts to contain or reduce CWD, especially in the Eastern Plains units where it's really high? And uh, this person added, anecdotally, they've heard many people say that there are a lot fewer mature big bucks now, especially whitetail. So we have done our flights, uh, both with helicopter and fixed wing, uh, looking at post hunt surveys. And initially, I don't wanna nail us down to any numbers, but uh, it seems as though the populations are similar to what they were um, and what we expected and saw last year and the year before. So I think the population overall is doing okay. When it comes to um, what are we doing to curb CWD, um, in 2019, we did our mandatory sampling and we got our prevalency rates. And we looked at that, we looked at the, um, the direction that the commission gives us through our CWD management. And we 
worked to through our licensing to bring down our buck doe ratios um, so that they're down um, closer to our new and updated herd management plan goals. So for the last three, four years, we've been working on that. And in 2023, we'll be doing mandatory testing out here on the plains again, and we'll get to see how that has affected and um, addressed chronic wasting disease. And from there, then we'll have to uh, either continue with what we're doing or reassess what we're doing at that time. Yeah, there's, and, and Kirsten and Todd, you can also jump in here too, as far as the big bucks, you know, the biologists out there and some of the people I've talked to out there, have, there are some big bucks out there without a doubt. Oh, absolutely. Yes, we've had some uh, very happy hunters this fall. Um, but I think anytime you hear CWD, there's definitely a, a concern that we're going to lose those upper age classes. And and by all means, that that could happen. Um, but uh, from what I heard this fall, it seemed that people were generally OK with what they saw and what they harvested. Thank you both. Um, we have a question. What is the CWD rate range in elk? And I was just trying to see if we had numbers out on that yet. So I can say that last year um, we've been alternating which units we have mandatory CWD testing for and which hunt codes. And so four out of five years, we require deer DAUs, as you saw, to uh, hunter rifle hunters in those units to submit um, samples for CWD testing. And last year was elk. So we had elk from select hunt codes were mandatory uh, to be submitted for CWD testing. And I'm not entirely sure that we have those numbers. Um, some of our elk seasons just ended on January 31st. And so I don't know that that's been compiled or relayed um, quite yet, but I would be watching for it as 2021 is when we um, required elk submissions. And Lance, I don't know if you've got any more insight on that. You know, um, that's what I know. Yeah, I don't. I, I totally agree with you. We haven't got the, the data back. However, I can say that it, it seems like the elk prevalence rate kind of follows the deer, albeit lower than what we're seeing in deer. But it's still in those same years where it's high deer, it tends to be high in elk as well, but lower than what we're seeing in deer. So, Thanks, Lance. Um, and then uh, please elaborate on the moose problems. Um, I think that's about the some of the conflict maybe that you alluded to with some of our, our uh, moose populations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and Jason and Jason and, and Mark, I don't know if you want to jump in and talk about some of those issues I know like at Brainerd Lake is a big issue or has been in the past up by Ned and Ward. Well, I'll, I'll just chime in quick, Lance. I, I mean, the the biggest problem we see the we tend to have in area one with, with moose and people conflicts is usually tied to some kind of domestic pet, usually a dog that's alongside. Um, and uh, it's just the, the moose are just so, um, it just seems so mellow until you cross that threshold. And, um, and that's been our big problem is just uh, um, them going after people who have dogs, um, at least in our, our neck of the woods. So um, I don't know about Jason and, and Matt, but that's our big issue. And we're seeing it more and more with uh, people wanting to get closer for a picture. Yeah, I'd, I'd piggyback on what Mark Lamb just said. Uh, we have those same issues in area two. And then uh, we're also starting to get a few more issues with folks that have just little tiny hobby farms up in the mountains and they have feed out and uh, we're getting moose that are coming into um, those livestock you know, areas, pets and uh, um, corrals and finding grain. And um, you know, we're hitting them with bean bags. Uh, our Boulder South, officer just hit tased one a couple days ago um, just no interest in in wanting to leave uh, but not not a, exactly being aggressive towards people per se but just um, making a lot of folks uncomfortable uh, because they're not they're not showing much fear I mean they, they don't typically but 
uh, when you're trying to feed your animals and uh, they're just waiting for you, that's a problem. Um, and I, I think I would add to that too. We just, we see moose dispersing into urban areas more and more every year. So Matt uh, Martinez could probably speak to his staff having to relocate moose every year uh, that are from Thornton and Lakewood and places where um, a big bold animal like that doesn't tend to um, coexist very easily. I mean, that they need to be where they've got space and, um, and habitat. So, great. Um, okay, we'll do one more. Um, a person says they're surprised to hear that the deer DA, the deer DAU4, the Pooter Red Canyon, excuse me, they're surprised to hear that deer DAU4, the Pooter Canyon Red Feather are herd are stable. In my hunting, I'm seeing fewer and fewer deer each year. I don't know if Brandon or Jason want to speak to that herd specifically. Um, yeah, sometimes we hear that uh, where there's uh, just a shift in how animals are using the landscape. And so they're fewer where, where you've been, but they're still around, but I'll let Jason answer that. Yeah, and and you know the other thing too to keep in mind with that is is obviously with the Cameron Peak fire, there's been there's it's it's been interesting since then. So recently, and I know the 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 attendee said that in over the years, but I would say certainly for last year, the 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 Cameron Peak fire, we're still trying to figure out how that is impacting all of those big game animals up up the canyon, red feather and pooter. The rest of it. Um, they are, you know, all of the data collection that we do, the flights do show that the, the herd is stable. And, and I mean, that unfortunately that maybe that is, maybe that is part of the, of like Kristen said, with the dispersal of the animals and they do tend to change their behavior. We're having more people move into those areas up there. We're getting more recreationists up there year round. So, I mean, there's a lot of impacts that are going on in the Poudre Canyon that if you look at 10 years ago, just weren't there. So um, it, it's, it could be a lot of those different factors, but from, from what the data that we're looking at, it does show the, the herd is as definitely being stable. Yeah, but just, if, just along but, with that, Jason, like our population is right now for deer, D4s, we have over 14,000 deer. And over the last several years, our fawn recruitment has been pretty high compared to previous years. So. Yeah, and I would say, you know, for things like that with, you know, for the attendee out there, if, if as you get closer to the hunting season, what I would recommend is to reach out to our office in Fort Collins and they'll, they'll put you in touch with the with the officer in the in the area you're hunting because they may be able to give you some more updated information on where you might find those deer. That's, you know, that's one of the things is our field guys really enjoy doing is, is trying to connect people with animals. So I would recommend you know, anybody, any attendee on this, if, if you're having issues like that, to reach out to the office and, and try to get to the, try to get to the boots on the ground, because, you know, we've got a lot of experience in this area. Thank you, Jason. Um, okay, we, uh, I'm going to move over to, or give it to Scott, let's be getting towards the end of the evening, I've lost my ability to speak. Um, and Scott's going to talk a little bit about Keep Colorado Wild just briefly, um, and then we'll have Jody talk about our, our public process with some of the license allocation, and then hopefully we'll have enough time to uh, answer the rest of your questions. So Scott, I'm getting your slide up here, but you can take it away. All right, thanks, Kristen. Um, I'm glad everybody's able to make it this evening. Um, I'm Scott Rausch, the Deputy Regional Manager for the Northeast Region, and I'm gonna switch gears on you a little bit here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Keep Colorado Wild Pass. Um, this was passed with a bill last year, uh, last April it passed, and CBW staff's been working on implementing it. Um, and really what's behind the bill is it's just, it's a, uh, what we wanna try to do is create a simple, uh, affordable state park pass. Um, that provide that will also provide sustainable um, funds for state parks into the future. Um, so the way that this is going to be done is is through your vehicle registration. So starting in 2023, you'll have on your vehicle registration, you'll have uh, you can opt out of the the pass. Um, we hope people don't, and we hope people opt in and that they buy the pass. The pass price will be set uh, at 
half of what our uh, annual pass is right now. So that's $80. So the most it will be is $40. So it's being, making very affordable. Um, we've been looking at, you know, some studies and done some pricing studies and everything. And right now the staff is recommending a price around $29 for that pass. Um, so what we would, you know, it, there's a lot of vehicles. If you look in Colorado, it's 5 million vehicles in Colorado. And if you look at what percentage of those will be, will buy a parks pass and, and where people will be at. Um, so it has the potential to really increase our revenue. And, and what we really need to do is be able to have that sustainable um, funding into the future. And I've put up a couple of things on here, kind of the main points on here is to strengthen our existing state park system. Um, that first 32 million up to 32 and a half million will be directly to parks. And that is to operate our existing 43 state parks. And that's for the operations and for staffing levels. Um, you know, over these past um, years here, especially when we went through COVID and it was really bad and we've seen a 30% increase and it's just, it's really getting difficult to try to keep up with. Um, we, the other part we look at is once after that 32 and a half million, we look at uh, the protect and educate the outdoor um, recreationists. Um, with that money is available, it'd be two and a half million that would go to the search and rescue fund and then 1 million to the avalanche safety awareness. Um, and then above that, um, any revenue above that 36 million that will be split equally um, between the, the parks fund and the cash and the wildlife cash fund. Um, and those things would be used for like uh, building new state parks and in a partnership with local governments, uh, growing CPW capacity. Um, we would increase state trails programs and then the dedicated resources for the uh, state wildlife action plan is uh, where that would go into the wildlife cash fund. So um, there's a lot of unknowns right now and we're really looking at, you know, what is that price point? What is that opt-in rate? And that will really drive those revenues. Um, currently, we make uh, in our park pass entrances is about uh, in about 22 million. So that's an extra 12.5 million is what the expectation is. So that will really help sustain our funding into the future and be able to operate our parks that uh, everybody enjoys going out to be. You know, and we have a lot of hunting on parks and everything like that. And 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 they are all all of our uh, revenue on the park side is through passes and, and then the end our uh, um, registrations and, and that fund our, our programs and our operating. So this will really help us into the future. So um, that's kind of just a quick little update and where we're at. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that people have at the end too. I'm not seeing any questions on KCW. Um, so we will, Go ahead and, oh, Mark Leslie has a question. I, I do. I, I would mention that, uh, and I think Scott may, may have mentioned it, the, the Parks and Wildlife Commission will be reviewing the pricing evaluations and make the final determination on what that price will be for the pass. And so our CPW recommendation right now is $29, but we'll pre be presenting that uh, to the commission at the March meeting and uh, they will take a look at that and make the determination on that. So thank you, Scott. It's great. Scott's been doing a great job. Uh, he was a park manager at Chatfield for 10 years and has worked for the agency for what, 26? About uh, 28 now. Yeah. 28. And I don't, uh, I, don't I, I don't quite put myself in the dinosaur category yet, but I'm knocking on the door. So <laughs> <laughs> you're getting there. You're getting there, but but no, thank you for, for all your work on that. It's been really helpful to have your, your ground truthing and expertise on, on this process and, and how this will actually work with the implementation on our park. So I just want to say thank you. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Um, and now to as the grand finale, we're going to have Jody, and she is here to solve all of your issues with licenses and crowding and just to make the world a perfect place. And she's going to tell us how that's going to happen in, in about five minutes. So, um, Jody, it's all you. Great. No, no pressure at all. Thanks, <laughs> Kristen. Um, yeah, I'm, I've got the easiest problems, right? So I'm Jody Kennedy. I do public involvement in planning. So my role in looking at license distribution is really trying to support um, all of our staff here tonight and, and everyone across our agency and really making sure we get good input um, from you all and from those persons. So CBW has been looking, um, taking a look at our big game license distribution practices. And this is in response to a lot that we've heard from our sports persons and, and public and as well as our commissioners. And, and so I'm gonna 
paste some FAQs in the chat. Um, those are up on our website to give you a little more background. Again, I'm really focused on the public involvement and planning aspect of this. What I will say is based on the feedback that we've gotten, we've sort of honed in on four issues related to um, big game license distribution. And those are the allocation of licenses between residents and non-residents, our preference point system, our weighted point system um, for sheep, moose, and goat, and then also our over-the-counter elk licenses. And so all of these topics are really big and you can imagine um, we could spend years on just one of those, but they're also all interrelated. Um, and if you change one, it could impact the other. So we're, we're really just trying to provide opportunity for sports persons to give us feedback and, and information on how they think our current policies and regulations are working and whether or not we need to open these up and, and consider changes. So to get input, um, as many of you know, we put out a public comment form last November. We received over 10,000 responses, which um, is a lot for us. And 70% of those were residents and 30% were non-residents, large majority identified as hunters. Um, and, and we heard, yeah, we heard interest in, in looking at license allocation and it came from a lot of different angles. We also heard interest in, in our preference points system. So we're continuing to, to dig into these issues. And right now in this process, we're getting ready to send out um, a survey that will go to a randomly selected invitation only list of licensed hunters, both residents and non-residents um, across different uh, methods of take. Um, and is really, is really that survey will ask a lot of different questions. It's really geared toward helping to inform our big game season structure process that we do every five years. Uh, and it's really geared toward getting a random sample to kind of tell us what the average sports person is thinking about um, our policies and programs for big game hunting. And so that's gonna go out um, this spring or this winter sometime. And then at the same time, we're also gonna be looking to do focus group meetings. So as some of you know, if you filled out our public comment form, you had an opportunity to volunteer to serve on a focus group. We got over 4,500 volunteers to serve on the focus group. So clearly we can't have a focus group. But for those of you who know what a focus group meeting is, like the ideal number of participants is between six and eight. Um, maybe you can stretch it to 10. And those are really invitation small meetings um, designed to you know, have a dialogue with sports persons. Um, and, and really try to, to get more into the details of these complicated issues and get some meaningful feedback. So we'll be looking at doing a number of those this spring, and then we will open up public opportunity to have some, some, um, some workshops and some larger meetings and some more public comment opportunity over the summer. Uh, if, you, if you follow our, our big game license process, you would know that for any changes, to go into effect for the 2023 seasons, our Parks and Wildlife Commission would have to adopt those no later than November of this year. So we're really concentrating on trying to get public input um, right now and into the summer, and then those will inform um, any potential changes you might see come before the commission uh, in the fall. And, and so with that, um, I will also say that the sports persons round table, the statewide round table, when they meet, will be discussing this issue and have an opportunity to dig into it deeper. So for, for folks who have comments and wanna communicate them to your delegates, um, your delegates will be at that meeting and, and, and we'll have a chance to kind of dig into that in more detail. So with that, Kristen, maybe I'll, I'll turn it back over um, to you and, and see where you wanna go from here. I'm sure we could spend all night talking about just one of these issues and, and there's quite a lot, so. Yeah, thanks Jody. and she's right. There's a lot to this. So um, check out that FAQ. You can email any one of us um, if you wanna discuss it more in depth or, um, or hear more about it. It's a pretty important issue. We need a lot of 
um, participation and people having it on the radar and uh, contributing comments and feedback. So, um, so I don't I don't see any questions uh, in the question box about this, um, but I did, but we've got a few minutes now to answer questions. So we'll go through some of the questions that are already in the Q and A and another one that was submitted ahead of time. Uh, and then uh, if you've got additional questions, we will stay and answer as many of them as possible. Um, and as I said, I will, I will email out that polling link again. If you didn't get a chance to vote during the meeting, um, you'll have a, about an hour after the meeting's over to, to vote um, for your representative. Uh, and I will follow up and let you know what the results were. So I will just start with this question that was submitted about the duck season. Um, any consideration for moving the duck season to start a week later and end a week later with global warming? It seems like the ducks arrive later and later each year. Um, and um, I can certainly answer that unless someone's got better perspective on it. I don't see anybody coming off mute. Um, so we, we do, I mean, it sounds like based on this question, this person understands there's only so many days that we can have a season open uh, for duck hunting and that's federally regulated, but we have a little flexibility in when those seasons are. And um, it seems like every public process I've been a part of um, for duck seasons, there's you know a different opinion for every single duck hunter in the room um, of what they prefer and where they hunt and what works best for them. And so I think there is consideration for, for moving the duck season and changing it. And we entertain it um, on a, a, an annual basis. Um, and so just, continuing to, to submit those comments where you have the opportunity is important. And we do, we do look at it, but of course, any impacts we have um, to, uh, to, to, to one person's season impacts another person's season. And so we, we, we try to find a balance and we do consider that ducks are, might be changing some uh, migration patterns as well, but we always get crazy winter weather that also seems to impact where and when ducks um, are. So does anybody have anything else to add to that question? Just. I thought you did really well, Kristen. So thank you. <laughs> and so. I think the biggest point is, right, if no matter where you change it, you're impacting either the early season hunter or the late season hunter. And um, having hunted both this year, uh, the early season wasn't terrible. Um, there was a lot of ducks early on and then it, um, towards the very end of the season, we had more ducks coming through with all that great weather that we had. So um, I didn't hear a lot of complaining other than in the middle of the season when people felt it was dry. Thank you. We've had Thanks, a lot Tom. of, this comes up just about every time we look at our, our chapter five waterfowl regulations. And uh, we have done surveys, we've done public meetings and we're a different, system up here on the plat generally than we get down on the Arkansas. And so the duck hunters down there have a, have a different um, opinion about how the season should be split. And so they would prefer to have their seasons down on the Arkansas work the later part of the, of the, of the split uh, to the very end. And so up here we've done, like I said, we've done some outreach and we've, we found that, that the hunters are generally pretty satisfied. We do a lot of off channel work on our state wildlife areas to develop those earlier seasons. And so um, we, we feel like we're, we're trying to strike that balance. I guess I've, I probably repeated what you guys both said, but I just wanted to reiterate it. It comes up every year, comes up on the commission meetings and uh, we, we think we're, we're in a pretty sweet spot, but we, are, we definitely are looking at different patterns in weather. Thanks. Okay. Um, so we had a question, it says, isn't that just a guess on bobcat numbers? So I think that was referring back when Mark was discussing when we were talking about um, bobcat populations. And the only thing, and again, anybody else can jump in, but the only thing I would add to that is, you know, bobcats are, they're um, a fur bear species, they're managed for small game, and, and we don't have the, the same ability to do population census that we do on some of the big game where we just don't 
have as many such as deer or elk. Um, and so we don't um, do population surveys in the same way that we do big game species as we were discussing earlier. And so I don't know that anybody gave specific numbers, but um, I don't think it's a guess to say that we've got a pretty healthy population. I think um, we're definitely seeing bobcats expand their range. We're seeing, um, you know, bobcats and in, in all the places in their habitat that we would expect them to be. Um, and so occupied habitat is, is one way that we can look at, at bobcat numbers as well. So um, I don't know, do anybody else have anything to, to add on bobcat numbers? I don't, I don't think anybody gave a number or suggested that we know how many bobcats there are, um, but I think we have a lot of evidence to suggest we have healthy populations. Yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Kristen. The other thing is, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more bobcats actually in the city, like Le <laughs> western suburbs, Lakewood, you know, Arvada, uh, down south by Chatfield. So they're actually becoming more, it seems like they're becoming more common in the cities, at least the western suburbs anyway. Yeah, I, I manage yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I can, I can add to that just a little bit. Um, in my 15 years in, the, in Area 5 and the six metro counties, um, I've definitely seen, and my staff has seen an increase in bobcats. Um, we think and we believe it's always been a healthy population. We still believe it's a healthy population, um, but we seem to be seeing them in more in instances and in more places than we used to. Um, could be, it could be a part of, um, people having cameras placed everywhere now and recording things that they didn't use to record. Um, but, uh, you know, I can, I can just say, you know, at least anecdotally that we're just seeing a um, bobcats in more places. Thanks, Matt. Kristen, I can jump in and help out with some of these questions. Uh, I'll let the, you. the next one we got um, was, with the gun death of a bow hunter last year, has there been any or any discussion of moving to archery only seasons? So uh, I don't I don't want to I talk too much. Um, there there was some discussion about uh, blaze orange during the muzzleloader season and having archery hunters wear blaze orange. Uh, we encourage archery hunters during the muzzleloader se season to consider wearing blaze orange uh, as a safety protocol uh, to, to move the bow hunting season um, and to separate the bow hunting season from the muzzleloader season entirely is going to be a, a big game season structure issue. And so every five years we look at how we structure our, our big game hunting seasons and if there's any changes that need to be made. Um, uh, the the um, so, so that would be an appropriate place to bring that up. And I, I paused for a second because I don't want to um, uh, not, not deal seriously with the, the death of the, the bow hunter. And of course that was tragic and, um, and that was investigated and the reasons that that occurred, um, you know, we will educate against and, and try to work um, towards solving that. But I think is a general question of um, overall safety and how we want to structure the big game seasons. Um, that is a big, bigger, broader question that we want to include all sports persons on um, in, in a solution. And I, I would imagine how this question is worded that um, some uh, muzzle loader hunters might have objection to um, not having their season as traditional. And so trying to balance needs and safety and uh, wildlife management is, is difficult. And so that's, that's why we have that public process every five years. That, that was a little long and rambling. Anybody have any clarity for me? Mark does. And well, actually the, the division, CPW staff brought the issue paper forward to have the discussion with the commission about should we do something to address the issue? And so the commission will be the body that will decide yes, no, you know, an alternative and we've heard from um, archery hunters and we've heard from others in the sporting community about it. So um, the, the commission is really the body that will address that.
yeah. Um, that's some good clarity. Thanks, Mary. Okay, move along to the next one here. Um, the question is, I have read about whitetail as a reservoir species for COVID. Is the same true for mule deer? Has anyone looked at that? Yeah, I can kind of go down there. Uh, you know, that stuff has occurred out in the Midwest and East, and we've never done anything uh, with our white-tailed deer here looking at COVID. So we have no data on that for Colorado. Thank you, Lance. Okay, we got a fisheries question here. Um, and the question is curious on what fishery plans are ahead for the Poudre River because of the fire impacts to the river drainages. Sure. Um, it's kind of a multifaceted question or um, that's proposed there. I um, mean, you know, we've got projects going on evaluating, you know, cutthroat populations way up in the, the headwaters of the Poudre that have been impacted. We've got the main stem um, as the cold water resource. And then we've also got, you know, the aquatic resource, even through the town of Fort Collins that potentially get impacted. Um, so one thing I'll just focus on right now is, um, what we found out this past fall from the reach of the main stem of the Poudre from Black Hollow, basically down to the Narrows. Um, we've got about 20 miles of river that were heavily impacted by uh, that flooding event this past summer coming out of Black Hollow Gulch. Um, virtually um, the entire fishery has um, been wiped out by that flood event. Um, what that's providing us um, is, is the opportunity to try to to introduce some hofer strain rainbow trout um, into that reach. Um, prior to whirling disease, the pooter had about a 60% composition of rainbow trout to 40% brown trout. Once whirling disease um, came into the pooter system, it became about an 85 to 90% um, dominated brown trout fishery. So now having 20 miles of, of fishless reach there, as the habitat starts to come back, as the uh, aquatic invertebrates or the forage base start to come back from the flooding events, uh, we're going to slowly be introducing some small whirling distant rainbow trout to see if we can take, if they will take hold in that system um, as it starts to recover from the fire and we can get some WD genetic um, uh, WD uh, resistant genes into the system that we can hopefully help bring back a wild river trout fishery into the, into the future. With all of the other stuff that I mentioned, um, Jason, I'm not sure if people have our contact information or whatnot available after this call, but if you want to reach out to me specifically on some more um, poignant questions on alpine environments versus you know the main stem to the pooter wherever it is, um, I can get you in contact with our local biologist and, and that person can help answer your questions a little more in depth as you look across the landscape. Yeah, I would second that, Jeff. I mean, and I would reach out to the to the Fort Collins office and they can get us, they can get you in touch, like Jeff said, with our local aquatic biologist for Area 4 or myself or, or Jeff. And, you know, one of the other opportunities that, you know, that comes from from something as tragic as that flood is, we're also CDOT because of it is having to do a lot of work on the river with culverts and things like that. So it's giving us an opportunity to work with CDOT on improving fish passage and, and things like that. So in the future, if we have events like this, maybe they won't be as devastating because, we, you know, we'll have a, a more updated system of water passage on there. So there's there's opportunities that are coming out of it. But like Jeff said, I mean, you know, we're it's gonna take a while because we did lose that large stretch of the river, unfortunately. So thank you. Um, moving along here, a little multi-part question. Um, starting asking if we could give an update um, on what CPW is going to do with the learnings from the access group that was convened back six to eight months ago. 
Um, yeah, I can answer that. Uh, so we, and I think this time last year when we had our, our caucus meeting, um, I had presented on this and spoke about it a little bit. We had a, a group of external stakeholders and internal staff who are working on trying to develop an access program that would give hunters and anglers more opportunities on private land, um, not necessarily acquiring that land or um, in the traditional ways we had before, but just providing access. Um, and so we had worked together and had several meetings. Um, well, we had three meetings with a stakeholder group and, uh, and it, it, it kind of, uh, we, what we've been doing since then is, you know, some of the feedback we got was some concern from landowners that we were coming to them with an ask and not providing them with any information or something that we could give them that it was just one, one more thing on their plate that we were asking them to do. Uh, and, and there was, you know, and they've been dealing with quite a bit, um, especially agricultural producers with just everything going on in the state. And so there was a little pushback there and, and our direction was to go back and, and talk to individual landowners and, and spend some more time finding out, you know, what incentives would be helpful. And so we've been working with field staff who our DWMs have, you know, out of our agency have the best relationships with landowners um, out of anyone else in the agency. They, they work out in the field, they live with, in these communities, they work with these, um, the landowners. And so we've been asking them to talk to their landowners and, and see how a program could benefit them and, and what the characteristics are. And we've even been asking them to maybe identify a property where we could offer some incentives and get some access and manage hunters and, um, or anglers. And, and see what we can do. And, and uh, I think what, what we've learned is that it's pretty complex and there's a lot of different incentives that would help out. And as it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, a, a landowner on the Eastern Plains doesn't have the same needs, wants, desires, issues that the landowner on the, the Western Slope does. And so, um, you know, somebody trying to manage pronghorn on their property is different than someone who lives in really pristine elk habitat. So um, we are, it, it's, there's not going to be a program with one size fits all. I don't think there's a simple solution and we continue to pursue it and, uh, and try to keep it in line with all the other priorities we have going on. So it's, it's not, uh, it's not gone away. We're still working on it. Uh, we're just trying to do it right. So it's the most successful it can be. Uh, and I can bring an update, maybe a little more detailed update to um, the, this, this group, this caucus, the next time we meet uh, in a few months. So um, I, will, I will make a note of that and maybe have a more, more detailed update on that. Thank you, Kristen. Maybe we can fit another one in here. I know we're approaching our, our hour, but um, this question is, is there any thought that Colorado may follow Arizona and Utah and ban trail cameras in the pursuit of wildlife? It's come up in discussions, but we haven't moved forward with an issue paper at this point, or we haven't ad addressed one. Um, we have, we've discussed it with our federal partners a little bit, but we haven't come to a conclusion on that. And I think as technology moves, I'm always saying that we're one step or two steps behind technology. And so there, you know, hunters and others will utilize technology that's available to, have, to help them find game and harvest game. And uh, where we can, we, we will try to address that issue. The other, the other thing that we need to consider when we're talking about this is how do we enforce any prohibitions that we might put on any hunters out there or others that are using these cameras. So that, that's always a consideration when we're looking at dealing with these issues. But again, I say that you know technology is something that's always evolving and we're gonna be continuing to deal with it. So we are thinking about it but we haven't landed hard on uh, a way to move forward on it yet. And I'll, I'll just be honest with you about that. Uh, 
Okay. Well, it is eight o'clock. Um, I bet we can answer this one last question. I think there's a reference to in the 1970s, it was reported that there were 10K statewide. That must be for Bobcats. Um, and, and that's a question I'd have to do more research on anyway. So I don't know that we can address that one. But the other question, um, it is about wolf reintroduction and the ballot measure um, says restore means an introduction is defined uh, in state statute. And that section defines introduction as a release of species that is currently not found or no longer found in the state. Um, wolves are currently found in the state. How can CPW releasing wolves fall under introduction definition and thus restore definition when wolves are currently found in the state? And um, I know um, I've wrestled with this question in the past. I don't know if anybody wants to come off mic if they've got a great answer for it. Um, I think our our direction by the state, uh, by the ballot initiative and by um, our administration is to, to go forward with a, a reintroduction plan and, and that's what we're doing. And that's not a very satisfactory answer, but um, I don't know that I have one. Oh, good, Mark's to my rescue again. <laughs> I think it's the best answer at this point, Kristen, to be honest with you. And I think we understand that there are concerns about it and we already have wolves on the ground, but we were mandated, as I mentioned earlier, to develop a plan to reintroduce wolves into the state by December, 2023. And we are moving forward with that draft plan through the process that I described earlier and will be finalized by the commission. Now, what that brings in the future, as far as what it actually looks like, it, you know, will we, end up bringing wolves in and what numbers and those kinds of things. That's all gonna be worked out with the SAG, the technical working group and the commission. And so we're gonna keep moving forward. We've expended a lot of uh, resources to develop this plan, this, the, to work, work towards developing the draft plan and we'll continue to do so. So uh, we're not, um, uh, unaware of the politics and we're not unaware of the legalities of it, but we have uh, a job to do and we're going to do it that way. So that's, that's what I can tell you about that right now. Well, thank you. I think we will uh, go ahead and wrap up for this evening. Uh, really appreciate everybody being here tonight. Uh, thank you to all of our staff who joined us this evening. I think everybody got a chance to weigh in on something or answer something. So it's really valuable to have everybody here. It's a great opportunity to ask questions and, and um, have us answer them as best we can. Um, I will be sending out that link to the poll. Um, again, it'll close at nine and I'll let you know what the results are at some point tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for coming and, uh, and have a, a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks everyone. Appreciate your participation and have a great night.